all their support. Um, and the reception with the cookies back there was all sponsored by SA Biotherapeutics. So thank you to all those people. Um, and then I'd like to introduce uh, our dean, uh, Dr. Shirley Lula Paul, who will uh, give a little bit about Dr. Stites before we begin. Thanks, Carly. Um, so, welcome everyone. I'm Charlene Wolfall, Dean of the College of Natural Sciences. I'll be really brief because I'm not the one you're here to listen to. Um, thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, we have an outstanding and inspiring speaker presenting. Um, first, just a quick reminder to silence your electronic devices and please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. You'll have an opportunity. Um, so on behalf of the Biology and Microbiology Graduate Student Association, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Joan Stites, Sterling Professor of Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry at Yale University, investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, American Philosophical Society, National Academy of Sciences, and Institute of Medicine, along with many other impressive affiliations. She has an incredibly long list of highly prestigious awards and honors, including 19 honorary degrees. She is a pioneer in the field of RNA biology and a powerful advocate for women in science. This evening, she will present on lupus and SNRPs, bench to bedside, and back again. Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Joan, uh, Joan Stites. You could turn this on first. Okay, I should be wired. Oh, <laughs> you could all hear me. Yes, indeed. And let me start by putting on my title. Um, somehow, the wording got a little bit convoluted in the transmission. So the title actually is From Bedside to Bench and Back Again. And so what I, what I wanted to do, OK, first of all, I wanted to th again thank the Graduate Student Association for inviting me. I've had a wonderful time being here and learned all sorts of interesting things. And I'm looking forward to learning even more uh, tomorrow. Uh, so what I want to talk about today on a much less scientific level than this morning's talk is about uh, the major, one of the major discoveries that my lab has been involved in over the years, which has to do with the disease lupus and little particles inside cells that are responsible for splicing the introns out of um, pre-messenger RNAs. And as I already indicated, this is sort of an unusual story in biomedicine. Uh, usually you think of scientists going to the lab making some discovery and then a drug company finds application of that discovery in clinical medicine. But this instead is a case where tools that physicians had discovered and characterized and knew about ended up being very important for making basic discoveries in molecular biology. And what I'm, what I'm thrilled about is that this has now gone back again, and I'll talk about this uh, at the end of this section, about to um, actually providing a therapeutic for a devastating disease, not sadly for lupus itself, but for another devastating disease that I'll be telling you about. Uh, the other thing to watch for throughout my talk is the very, very important role of serendipity in discovery in science. Uh, that you'll see several times in the talk. Okay, so I thought I would start out with a little bit more about me. Uh, just to tell you sort of where I came from and how I got into this. So you've already heard that I've been at Yale on the faculty for a very long time, actually since late 1970. Uh, but the way I got there was through a lot of other labs. And I want to tell you about this. Then I'll just tell you about the, the discovery and what it's led to in terms of a therapeutic. And then I want to just spend maybe just five minutes 
at the very end, reflecting on the state of women in science, which at least in academic science and medicine has gotten much, much better, as I think you've grasped since I started out. We're still not there, and I do have some ideas about some additional things that we need to consider in order to get us to real equity, which would be wonderful. So <clears throat> let me start out here with some prehistory. So I was born and grew up in Minneapolis, and uh, I was interested in science as a child, and I was very much encouraged by my father both to be interested in science and also encouraged to go to Antioch College in Ohio, which was his alma mater, mater. And the reason he felt that way, he was a high school guidance counselor. And he felt very fervently that not just men, but women also should have careers and should have training for those careers. And what Antioch College had, and was fairly unique in this, in this way, is a work study program where you didn't just spend all your time on campus in Yellow Springs, Ohio, taking courses, but every other term, you went off to some other place and actually worked in a working environment. And so I was very, very fortunate as a chemistry major at Antioch College to end up in Alex Rich's lab at MIT because it was a place that had had these co-op students from Antioch on sort of a rotating basis. When I actually went to Alex Rich's lab, the structure of the DNA double helix had been published eight years prior to that. But it was still so new that it hadn't made it to certainly textbooks and not even was mentioned in courses. So when I arrived in the lab at MIT and heard about this beautiful double-stranded structure and how the two strands could come apart and each one serve as a template for making an identical, strand of DNA. I was just absolutely enthralled because I've sort of been very curious about genetics as a high school student, but this was the first time that anybody had ever told me about anything that provided a molecular basis for actually thinking about the molecules that might underlie the whole process of genetic transmission. So I was very, very excited. Um, nonetheless, I decided after I was in several other molecular biology labs as an undergraduate, nonetheless I decided I should go to medical school. And the reason I decided that was I looked around me in these labs, I never saw a woman head of lab, I never saw a woman science professor, and it just didn't even occur to me that women could do this. Uh, women were research associates in somebody else's lab, namely a man's lab. Um, so I thought, well, maybe I should really go to medical school so I can have a career. And my attitude about that changed just the very summer before I was scheduled to go to Harvard Medical School when I ended up in Joe Gall's lab at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Joe Gall is a very prominent um, cell biologist, one of the amazing things that he did was discover how to do in situ hybridization studies. Um, most of his career was spent at Yale, and now he's at the Carnegie Institution in Baltimore, but he started out as an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota, and I wanted to be home with my parents before I went off to medical school, so I got a job in his lab. And for the first time, he gave me my own project to work on. When I've worked in labs before, I'd always be assisting a graduate student or a postdoc to do on their project. And so he gave me my own project, and he was packing up his boxes to move to Yale. And by August 1st, I decided, gee, do I really want to go to medical school? I love doing science and discovering things so much. And so I was able, with Joe Ball's help, and also I had met Jim Watson when I'd been in Alex Rich's lab at MIT because they were collaborators, competitors on polysomes and ribosomes and things like that. Um, I was able to arrange to switch to a graduate program at Harvard, a new graduate program in biochemistry and molecular biology. So I went off to Harvard instead of going off to medical school that fall and did the, the usual first year thing of taking courses. And when it came time for me to um, 
choose a lab to work in. I went along to a very prominent cell biologist at Harvard, uh, whose name I will not say, um, and asked if I could work in his lab on a problem that was similar to what I'd been working on in Joe Gall's lab. And he looked at me and he said, oh, but you're a woman and you'll get married and you'll have kids and then what good will a PhD do? I made it out of his office before I burst into tears. And I went along to, I hate to admit it, my second choice thesis advisor, <laughs> James Watson, who had already at that point won the Nobel Prize. Um, and Jim said yes. So I became a graduate student in his lab instead. And it was one of, obviously, one of the best things that ever happened to me because what was going on then in molecular biology was that it was a new field, it was a new field. There weren't maybe 50 labs in the entire world that were in this new field. Um, it was peopled by uh, scientists who had come from physics or microbiology or virology, all sorts of different disciplines. And everybody was interested in figuring out the molecular basis of life. And it was just a very, very exciting time to be in this field and to be starting out and feel really privileged uh, to, to, to have been there. Um, in fact, at the time that I was in Jim's lab, people worked exclusively on bacteria and their viruses, the bacteriophages. And this was because it was very fervently believed that if you were gonna figure out anything, you had to start simple. And people even had the attitude, I remember hearing this, that people who were trying to work on mammalian cells, and of course it was the very beginning of cell culture back then, were wasting their time because they would never be able to understand anything that was as complicated as mammalian cells. So you can sort of imagine, you know, how I feel about what has happened in molecular biology during my lifetime. I mean, I never imagined as a graduate student that we would ever know the four billion base pairs of human DNA and the impact that that would have in, say, medicine in terms of both therapeutics and diagnostics. I certainly never dreamed that there would be a multi-million, billion, must be multi-trillion dollar biotech industry now, making things both for medicine, for agriculture, that, that everything that's known about DNA would have such an impact on our understanding of evolution, even impinging on forensics. And I cer certainly never believed, looking around me, that women would ever hold leadership positions in science and in academia. So I'll get back to that at the, at the very end of my talk. Um, when I'm just going to give these few reflections on how, why, why we're where we are. Um, so I just need to tell you then how I got from Watson's lab to Cambridge um, before I came to Yale. And um, I got married and my husband was an x-ray crystallographer, so we went off to the Mecca of x-ray crystallography. And luckily it wasn't too bad in molecular genetics as well. Um, but when I got to the lab, another thing happened, as it did here, uh, because I was a woman that turned out to be very fortunate, and that was my choice of postdoctoral project. Um, there had been a project that had sort of been floating around the lab that my peers, who were all male postdocs, had all talked about and considered and thought would be a really great project to do, but it was so challenging that none of them dared take it on because they knew they'd have to have results in two years, which was the normal postdoc time at that, at that point, in order to go back to the States and get a faculty job. Uh, this was the project of binding ribosomes to messenger RNA and trying to figure out what the sequences were at the start sites of, of um, bacteriophage RNA translation. And I decided, well, you know, I'm never going to have a job. Women don't do that. I won't need to to go out and interview, so why don't I take on this really interesting project, which I did, and after you know a year of struggle, it started working. And then amazingly, when I started going around talking about it, I started getting job offers from all sorts of places that I never expected. 
Uh, there's just one more episode that I need to tell you about that occurred just before we got to Yale. Um, my husband had already arranged before we went to England as postdocs to have an assistant professor position at Berkeley. And we were actually there for about six weeks or two months, something like that. And we asked about, you know, well, could there possibly be an assistant professor position for me? And the answer was, well, all our wives love being research associates in our lab. Isn't this what your wife wants to do? And so we decided we'd go to Yale, where we've both been offered assistant professor positions. So that's how we got to Yale a very, very long time ago, fall of 1970. Okay, so let me go on now and start the second part, the long part of my talk, um, about lupus and the discovery of SNRFs and their role in pre-mRNA splice lupus. Uh, that's basically a short word for systemic lupus erythematosus, which is um, just one, perhaps the best known, of a group of diseases that are known as rheumatic diseases or autoimmune diseases. Uh, this includes other things like mixed connective tissue disease, um, scleroderma, uh, polymyositis, dermatomyositis. And what all these diseases have in common is that in the serum of the afflicted people, and I should say the diseases are more common in women than in men, they afflict about a thousand, or one in a thousand in our population, perhaps more. Uh, they're more common in blacks than in whites. Um, and what they all have in common is circulating autoantibodies in the bloodstream. So to start here really simple, you all know that the immune system makes antibodies, which are protein molecules that recognize and counteract um, foreign substances. And so they're normally made against bacterial proteins, viral proteins. And of course, because cancer cells display on their surface, sometimes abnormal protein, sometimes cancer cells, and you all know that this phenomenon is now being exploited in terms of the immunotherapy that seems to be working so, so well for, for some types of cancers. And usually our immune systems are very fastidious about not making antibodies against their own cellular components. But sometimes this whole regulation system goes awry, usually during the second or third decades of life, and people start making antibodies against their own cellular components, which of course are called autoantibodies. So what happens if you have autoantibodies circulating in your bloodstream is that cells will die, they'll dump their contents into the blood, and so you'll have cellular components floating around, and if you happen to have autoantibodies, like the, the blue one pictured here, sort of a crude antibody, and here's a crude SNRP with its RNA and protein components. These immune complexes, as they're called, sort of form these networks, and a lot of the pathologies associated with lupus and these other diseases have to do with the deposition of these immune complexes. So they deposit in the fine capillaries of the skin, and cause a red sort of rash, and that's what get, gave rise to the name lupus, the sort of red rash on the face. They deposit in the hair follicles, make sure hair fall out, they deposit in the joints, give you joint pain, they deposit in particularly the anti-DNA antibodies, deposit in kidneys and cause kidney problems. So these are systemic diseases that affect the whole body because there are these those autoantibodies. So the next thing you might ask is what types of cellular components tend to be targeted by autoantibodies in the lupus and these other diseases? And it turns out, and I think for reasons that still aren't really understood, that they target very highly abundant, very conserved cellular components, such as the components of the central dogma of molecular biology, things like DNA, RNA, <coughs> proteins. And so this is a picture of gene expression happening in bacteria, so we have the DNA with RNA polymerase molecules moving along it, making longer, oh sorry, it's going this way down here, making longer and longer chains of RNA and then the ribosomes adding on uh, to synthesize proteins off the messenger RNA. 
And so, as I sort of alluded to, lots of lupus patients make anti-DNA antibodies that end up with kidney problems, usually. Um, many um, lupus patients make antibodies against ribosomes, actually, and it causes a sort of weird form of uh, pathologies. Um, and a lot of lupus patients make antibodies against SNRFs. But SNRFs are not in this picture because SNRFs aren't in bacteria. This is a bacterial picture. And in order to tell you about SNRFs, I need to go back to the early 1970s in molecular biology. So that was a time at which the field had gotten much bigger than when I was a graduate student 10 years earlier. And um, people had knew something about replicating DNA. They knew something about the RNA polymerases that then transcribed the DNA into RNA. They were learning lots about the protein synthesis machinery and ribosomes. Um, and in fact, it was sort of weird because there were some molecular biologists that thought that this had been the golden era of molecular biology, and now it was basically all over because when people would go on to study higher cells, they wouldn't find anything fundamentally different. They'd find more bells and whistles uh, in terms of how cells did things, but nothing that was profoundly different. And we now know how, how very wrong that was. Um, but that was the sort of prevailing theory, but there were a few things that were bothersome with respect to that theory at that point. And one of them, as you know, uh, is the amount of DNA in various or in the cells of various organisms. So this is a picture of the amount of DNA that would be in a bacteriophage. It would have several hundred genes. Here's the amount of DNA in a bacterium with several thousand genes, about tenfold as much. But when you get to a mammalian cell, all of a sudden we have a thousandfold more DNA. And the question was, what was all this DNA doing? Nobody thought we had a thousand times as many genes as bacteria, maybe 10 times or 100 times, but not a thousand times. Uh, the other thing that was very weird about mammalian cells was that it was known that they make lots of RNA, but that only about 10% of that RNA ever appears in the cytoplasm in the form of messenger RNA, and the rest of it just gets degraded in the nucleus before it ever gets out. So I decided, as a person who worked on RNA, that this would be a good new direction for me to go in. And when we have a sabbatical coming up in 1976-77, I decided that I would try to work on this problem and try to figure out what was happening to all this excess RNA that was made in mammalian cells. And what I did was, oh, here's another picture of DNA making RNA, but this is in the nucleus of a vertebrate cell. And so the little dots you see here are not ribosomes as they were in the prokaryotic slide, but are a class of very highly conserved RNA binding proteins called HNRP proteins that then coat the nascent transcripts. And I thought that if I could somehow get antibodies against these HNRP proteins, that I might be able to use them to study the interaction between these proteins and then newly synthesized RNA, and that that might somehow provide clues as to why certain sections of the RNA were getting degraded and turned over, and the rest of the RNA, the tiny fraction of the RNA, was going out to the cytoplasm to serve as messenger RNA. Um, it turns out these proteins are very highly conserved. I spent seven months injecting purifying them, injecting them into rabbits and rats and chickens and everything that might make antibodies and never did because they're so highly conserved and non-immunogenic. Uh, so I gave up and did something else for the rest of my sabbatical. But as all of you will know, um, 1977 was the year that introns were discovered. And it was one of those wonderful happenings in molecular biology where evidence that people didn't understand from all over the world sort of came together at a Cold Spring Harbor meeting. And what became clear was that there were parts of our genomes that are actually 
spreads parts of them the in between the intron regions that were thrown away um, during the slicing process in the nucleus accounting for the large RNA wastage and that our messenger RNAs then had to be put together in this particular way. And of course, Bill Sharp of MIT and uh, Rich Roberts of Cold Spring Harbor received the Nobel Prize for figuring, figuring this out. Um, so that went a long ways towards explaining the too much DNA. Uh, but what it really did was to sort of shift the problem a bit, and I love this slide, um, to what is the cellular machinery that very precisely recognizes the junctions between the sense part and the non-sense part of our RNAs and makes very precise cuts and joints them back together so that they can be sent as total messenger RNAs just to be read um, by the ribosome. And when I came back to my lab at Yale in the fall of 1977, everybody wanted to work on this problem, but quite frankly, we were clueless as to how to go about it. And then happened, a couple of months later, happened a piece of serendipity that was instrumental. There was a new uh, nature that arrived in the lab and among the short articles at the back uh, was one with this title. And I've underlined this sentence here, patients with MCD, TD, it's connective tissue disease, one of the lupus related syndromes, have high titers of antibody to nuclear ribonucleoprotein, in other words, RNA proteins, uh, which also gives the speckled nuclear pack and blah, blah, blah. And the reason this caught my eye was that while I had been trying to make antibodies against nuclear RNA binding proteins from rat liver cells the year before and failing, several people had mentioned to me, well, you know, I think I've maybe heard of some patients or something like that that would have antibodies that sound like the antibodies you're trying to make. But at that point, I didn't know any more about it. But when this article came out, I had in my lab a brand new MD, PhD student named Michael Lerner, who was just fresh from all his medical school courses. And I said to Michael, do you know any physicians here at Yale Medical School who might have patients that might be making this particular kind of antibody. And he said, sure, I'll go see Harden. Harden turned out to be John Harden, who was the head of the rheumatology division in a building directly across the street from our lab. And Michael went over there that afternoon and came back with five or six little vials of blood and immediately started to work with them. Uh, now, the sobering part of the story is, of course, if that happened today, you'd have to spend weeks, if not months, or maybe years, filling out human investigation forms in order to get permission even to work with, you know, five mils of blood that a patient would gladly give you for research purposes. But back in those days, those regulations didn't exist. So Michael could start right away working to see whether the antibodies in the sera were the antibodies that I've been trying to make and failing. And so the question is, you know, what do you, what do, you do with antibodies um, in that context? Well, basically what you can do is grind up cells, try to fractionate their contents, and use the antibodies as a sort of probe to monitor where the antigen that you're after is actually going in that fractionation so that you can identify what the antigen is. And he spent, you know, at least a year of frustration doing that for a couple of reasons. Um, one reason was that he was using liver cells, which are bathed in serum. Serum contains ribonucleases. As he purified the ribonucleases, were chewing away at the RNA components of what turned out to be the SNRP, so the antigen was disappearing. And the other thing is we didn't really have good ways of capturing antigen antibody complexes and looking at what was in there. And then happened the second piece of serendipity that was really important was that a woman named Joan Ruge came to give a job seminar. She was just finishing her postdoc. And I mentioned her name because she's just finished <coughs> being for two decades the chairman of cell biology at Harvard Medical School. Um, and she talked about a brand new reagent that she had used in her postdoctoral work called Pro Protein A, 
from Staphylococcus aureus, which binds to the antibodies and can be used as a tool to pull the antibody antigen complexes out of a cell extract so that you can actually look at what's there. And at that point, my Michael took HeLa cells, labeled them with P32, so we labeled all the RNA and the DNA, and then used the, what was called pensorbin in those days, um, protein A preparations to do immunoprecipitations, and started for the first time getting patterns that looked like this. So what we're looking at here are all as a gel, fractionating the RNAs, the range in size from tRNA, so about 70 long, on up to this snRNA 2 which is 180 some long, uh, in the nucleus of cells, and you see all these different bands. Uh, Michael's own serum, he didn't have any autoantibodies, happily, immunoprecipitates nothing, but these various patients here are the little tubes that he got from the rheumatology section, gave these beautiful profiles of different patterns of immunoprecipitation. And the ones that are important for this talk are this one, the so-called anti-SM. It's an angel. A lot of patients have this specificity, but it was named after a woman who's a patient at Rockefeller, and anti-RNP, which just precipitates a subset. So it turned out that E2 and E1 had been previously identified and even sequenced in Harris Bush's lab at Baylor um, as very abundant nuclear RNAs, U4, U5, and U6 were new ones that we named and began to characterize. So then by doing the same experiment, instead of labeling with S35, so you could label the proteins, we were able to deduce that there was a set of small RNAs, ranging in size from about 100 to 200, uh, that then associated with some common proteins, those are some ones with the red dots, those are the SM proteins, and some unique proteins, and that these were you know, different complexes in the nuclear extract. Uh, so we called them SNRNPs for small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, and of course they're RNA protein complexes. We very early cottoned on to the idea that this one at least might be involved in splicing because the sequence of the U1 RNA was known and the sequence at the five prime end was complementary to what was then emerging. And this was only like six or seven sequences from new DNA sequencing databases as the five prime ends of neutrons. So we hypothesized that this might be involved in splicing. We had no idea what this one did. Um, other evidence that, that at that time um, sort of sort of buoyed up our um, our idea that these these particles might be involved in splicing rather than in you know coding the RNAs as I originally thought um, was where they are in cells. Here's an anti-ribosome antibody that you see used very nice fluorescence in the cytoplasm where there are ribosomes and also the nucleoli where ribosomes are made in the nucleus, whereas that anti-RNP serum that's specific for the U1 RNP shows the nucleoplasm, um, which of course is where the chromatin is, where the RNA is being transcribed, where it's being spliced. So that was compatible. And as, as time went on, your other labs uh, provided evidence for base pairing interactions between these SNRPs and the, so it's pronounced SNRPs even though it's spelled SNRP, um, for these, these specific interactions by making mutations either in these near mammalian cells in these conserved <coughs> splice site sequences, showing that you get a splicing deficient phenotype and then engineering into a U1 or a U2 molecule compensatory changes so that you could get the base pairing back and show that you could then restore splicing. So that was very powerful evidence that there actually was lots of base pairing between the SNRP RNAs and the pre-messenger RNA. And as time went on, it became apparent, I won't go into the details here, that not only U1 but also U2, U45, and U6 all of those major uh, particles containing the, the SM antigen carrying proteins uh, were involved in splicing. And in each one of these, there are 
short specific sequences that are complementary to elements that are conserved in introns. Uh, U1, the five prime splice site here, U2, the branch site, this region. U6 replaces U1 later in the splicing process um, at the five prime splice site, leaving the complementarity to this sequence after having been brought in by U4. And U5, during the second step of splicing, sort of base pairs and holds together the two axons so that they can be ligated in the second step of splicing. So um, by the late 1980s, I think everybody would, was willing to agree that there was this sort of extra step in gene expression in higher cells as compared to bacteria, where uh, the snRNA is in their proteinaceous particles will involve many other factors, and they were essential for splicing out the introns and giving rise to a contiguous messenger RNA that could go out to the cytoplasm and be can be processed and be translated. Um, and I just want to show you in the next slide. Uh, this was my group um, in the very early 1980s. This is Michael Lerner. Uh, Sandy Wallen has been a faculty member at Yale for a long time. She's now at the NCI. Various other people, postdocs, graduate students, undergraduates in the lab. This is my colleague, um, Sid Altman, who um, at the time was studying catalytic RNA and later received the Nobel Prize. And we thought at one point there might be some overlap between our SNRPs and what he was studying. So he was um, there that day discussing this possibility. Um, let me show you. I love this slide. This is lovely. This is a picture taken of Drosophila chromatin in the process of being transcribed and spliced. So again, here's the DNA, here are the RNA transcripts getting covered by HNR and P proteins, but sort of particles building up at certain sites and then coalescing, um, this being called the spliceosome, all these, these four, five SNRPs plus lots of other factors and the intron looped out just before it gets the messenger RNA. Um, and now I just want to fast forward by about 30 years to our structural understanding of the spliceosome, which started emerging in the 19, 2015, sorry, uh, because of the developments in cryo-EM so that people could actually get high resolution structures of the spliceosome, which has at least eight or 10 different states as you add things in go from step one to step two, and things come off and come back. Um, with just <clears throat> one picture here, which comes from one of the three labs, Reinhard Lerman's done in Germany, the other labs are Li Yongxi's lab in China, and Kyoshi Nagai's lab in England that have, have high resolution structures of, of various ones of the spliceosome. And most of it's protein, but uh, the part I love is the part of where all the RNAs are over here. And, very satisfyingly, it turns out that all the RNA-RNA interactions that have been predicted by genetics and biochemistry over this 30-year period uh, turn out to be visualized now that we're actually seeing how the, what the spliceosome looks like and how it works. Okay, so now let me turn to talking about how all this knowledge about splicing and the spliceosome has been turned into a really incredible therapeutic um, well, we were studying the mechanism of splicing. Lots of people were starting to realize and study the phenomenon of alternative splicing, uh, which simply means that during the process of splicing, the cell has choices or can make choices. For instance, here is a pre-messenger RNA with three axons. And there would be two different ways, or perhaps even more ways, of splicing this together to give two mRNAs that would give, they'd give two particular proteins, one with extra amino acids in it that might either localize it differently or change its substrate specificity um, from the other one. Um, so the genome is terribly, terribly flexible, and this extends now estimated that 95% of human genes are alternatively spliced to get more than one product. So if that's true, then it turns out that it's not really surprising that a lot of human genetic diseases arise from splicing mutations, mutations affecting splicing in some way. 
And the one that I want to tell you about is uh, mutations in a gene that gives rise to the disease spinal muscular atrophy, SMA, which turns out to be the most common genetic cause of childhood mortality worldwide, afflicts about one in 6,000 children born. It's the second most common fatal autosomal recessive disease disorder. The first most common is cystic fibrosis, which you've all heard of. And what happens in this disease is that there's a degeneration of particular cells in the spinal cord under muscular junctions that lead to eventual paralysis and muscular atrophy, the ability to make the muscles do anything. And what was also discovered over, over this period was that the gene that's affected in SMA encodes a protein called the SMN protein. It stands for survival of motor neurons protein. And that turns out to be a sort of assembly factor. So basically, this disease is a disease of splicing. If you can't properly assemble the RNA and protein components of SNRPs, you can't do splicing properly, and all sorts of things go wrong and they manifest themselves in this, this, this terrible disease that affects really, really little kids in its, in its worst state. But what was also discovered over that time was that humans, and perhaps some other primates, but not many, actually have two genes for this absolutely essential SNRP assembly factor protein, the SMN protein. And that only one of them, the primary one that makes the most of the protein, is mutated in the disease. So the question has been, well, what about the other allele, which only differs in something like nine nucleotides over the entire gene, the nucleotides both in introns and exons, from the good gene that is the one that's mutated in this, this horrible disease. And um, here I'm not going to go into very much science, but this is more of a scientific slide. Um, over the years, a lot of people studied this, and it turned out that what happens to this second gene is it's alternatively spliced, so you leave out exon 7. And exon 7 is essential for making a stable protein that can do its job. So what was then investigated was all the different factors. I mean, this is what looks like a circus, it is. The red ones are inhibitory factors, the green ones are contributory factors, the other ones are things that have to bind in order to get this exon spliced in so that you can get active protein. And what was then done was that it was reasoned that if there are negative factors, which there are, that appear to bind around this exon, if you could prevent those factors from binding to the second copy of the gene, that maybe you could then convince the machinery to splice in exon 7 instead of leaving it out. And so what was tried primarily by the Singh lab, used to be at UMass Med, now it's at Iowa State, and the Craner lab at Cold Spring Harbor, was to synthesize a whole bunch of RNA, well, DNA-modified uh, oligonucleotides that you could put into cells that would be designed to target these sequences to which these factors, these negative factors are binding. And if you could keep them from binding, then maybe you could splice in this exon. And that turned out that that worked. And then the wonderful thing that's happened since then is that um, it's been developed into a therapeutic that went through phase three clinical trials in 2016. And I'll just more or less read this. The results were so encouraging that the trial was phased out and all the patients put uh, onto a trial in which they received the drug Musnersen. Uh, and it included patients with mostly onset of signs and symptoms at less than six months of age. So the babies developed normally until that point, and then if they were to sit, they lose the ability to sit. If they've gotten as far as standing, they lose the ability to stand, and they basically just can't move. And that was true of this little girl by the age of one and a half. She'd lost the ability to sit. She never stood, she never walked, she never could do anything except lie there. And um, so this had an incredible sort of response. You can read about it in terms of motor milestones doing all this stuff. And this is Emma at the age of three, where she was actually walking with a walker. 
because of receiving these oligonucleotides that change the splicing pattern of this one particular um, gene. And so far, I mean, this has been going on now for a couple of years, there have not been any really truly adverse effects reported in lots and lots of kids have been much improved their prognosis uh, and their lives by this, by this treatment. So that's a success story. Um, just wanted to sort of mention that here along the way, um, we've had a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> these are, uh, we showed up at a Halloween party. Uh, so the, the Splice Girls, each one of them has a different snurf. Uh, with exons and introns, and I think there's a poly A tail over here. Uh, and it's basically been based on exploiting uh, these autoantibodies for much of this work from patients that have these autoimmune diseases, figuring out what they're recognizing and figuring out what those important cellular components are doing, either in splicing or in other aspects of, of gene expression. So um, let me, I want to, I told you, I warned you that I would spend just the last five minutes or so talking about some reflections on women in science. And this is not going to be terribly long, but I want to make just a couple of points. And I want to start out with a slide here. Um, oh, down there, reflections on women in science. I want to start out with this slide, which is sort of outdated, but makes a particular point. Um, Carolyn Neugebauer is now my colleague, but she spent a number of years in Germany at a Max Planck Institute, and in 2006 um, published an article uh, with this sort of scissors diagram in it. And what's being plotted here is the number of men versus women that start out as students, graduates, and get their PhDs at German universities, but the data aren't that different from US. And then as you move up the uh, academic ladder in Germany through being a sort of postdoc, habilitation, assistant professor, and professor showing that the fraction of women represented dropped precipitously. Uh, we're not quite so bad as this. We're somewhere in the upper 20% in the life sciences, but, um, but the pattern is still the same. And if you think about it, what this graph means is that every one of these points as you proceed, a man has a better chance than a woman of proceeding to the next step. And this is the problem, and this is what you know doesn't seem fair, and what we're all trying to figure out how to do something about. Um, I was very fortunate in 2005 in being asked to participate in a committee of the National Academy of Sciences that wrote, ended up writing this report in 2006, um, where the, the goal was to look at why the situation is the way it is and come up with a lot of recommendations. And what we mostly focused on, it was sort of a very enlightening experience for me and very, very interesting, uh, was to learn about unconscious bias, which I think most people now sort of know about, and how this is reflected in people's decisions about hiring, about promotions, et cetera, et cetera. And the report was lots of fun. The, the chairman of the committee was Donna Shalala, who had been the head of the um, Health and Human Services in the Clinton administration, and she's a dynamo. Um, and we read all this literature and had all these discussions and open forums and stuff, and then came up with a bunch of recommendations, you know, for universities that starting at the trustee level and going to the president's office and the dean's <coughs> offices and the department offices and thinking about you know how you could avoid unconscious bias in a lot of the promotion and hiring decisions and improve things that made recommendations for scientific societies to have equal representation of women and men as are in the field at the various meetings and in the publications made recommendations to congress about making sure that funding would be equitable and so on and it was a very very good report but one of the things I want to bring up, which came up at least for me, uh, subsequent to that report, 
uh, was learning about the phenomenon of social identity or stereotype threat, which I think is, you know, it's another thing that cognitive psychologists have analyzed and defined. But I think now um, it's probably a very, very important underlying reason why we're still in an un imbalanced state and why it seems to be taking so long to get us to the point where women are equally represented as their training befits in at least academic science and medicine. And what this, what this phenomenon is, it's defined here, recognition by a person that he, she may be devalued in a setting because of social identity. Simply being in the minority is what that means. And the physiological and cognitive responses to this uh, put you into a state of vigilance where there are consequences on, on both levels. Um, this, this original paper here that I know about um, reported a study at Stanford where they took a bunch of undergraduates and brought them, who were interested in math and science, and brought them in and showed them a video of a scientific meeting that either had 50% women, 50% men, or 30% women, 70% men. And then they measured, because there are ways of measuring this, this vigilant state, both cognitively and physiologically. You can imagine high blood pressure, faster you know, pulse rate, et cetera, et cetera, for the physiological ones. But there are also ways of measuring it cognitively. And what they discovered was that when women were even just 30% of the people who were at the meeting, they illustrated or exhibited vigilance that could, was measurable. It was only when it got to be 50% that it didn't matter, and meaning that women really felt comfortable. And if you think about it, you know, women in science are always in the minority, um, so you're always in this sort of state of vigilance, which has uh, even uh, effects on conceptual learning has been documented quite nicely. So, um, for me, this was a revelation because I remember being on committees back in the 1980s and 1990s where I was the only woman in the room and feeling that I couldn't say anything because I was sort of, just didn't feel like I could put myself forward. And clearly what I was undergoing was this phenomenon. And I must confess that knowing about it makes me at least be able to think, well, that's why I'm feeling this way. Of course you could do something about it. You know, speak up, say something. And that's the reason that I'm bringing it up with you guys, because if you didn't know about it, it's at least something you should know about and sort of work into the way you think about you and your experiences in science. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say about women in science is that I've found from having a lot of women in my lab over the years at various undergraduate, graduate student, and postdoc levels, is that I find that women tend to have much more unrealistic worry about the far distant future than men do, or than at least they express. Um, they tend to worry about, oh, I can't really do that when they're comparing themselves to somebody who's 20 or 30 years older than them. And that's ridiculous. I mean, you should think about getting to the next step, not getting to some goal so, so far off in the future. So there's lots to be done, and there's lots of changes that still need to be made, but we're making incredible progress compared to the stories I told you about what it was like when I started. And I'm just very, very thankful to have female colleagues in science at you know, many different universities across the US, and that's, that's wonderful. Okay, so I've gotten to the end, and I want to start, I want to just say, first of all, um, how indebted I am to my, my late husband, Tom. Uh, There's a picture of us shortly before we left Harvard to go to England, uh, who has always been incredibly supportive. It's very, very important for women to have supportive partners or spouses. And finally, then I want to also, th I should say thank you to my son, who's always been very understanding, and to um, lots and lots of graduate students, postdoc undergraduates in the lab. I found out that it's almost as much fun to share the joy of discovery with a younger colleague as it is to make the discovery yourself. And that continues to give one 
uh, joy and satisfaction. I'm grateful to my colleagues in my department in Yale Medical School, which was clearly very important for this whole venture into using clinical tools to make basic science discoveries. Uh, the international RNA community has been very supportive of women, a lot of prominent women RNA biologists, and then of course to uh, many, many funding sources. And again, to you for sitting here, and I hope maybe there'll be comments or questions. mistake of uh, splicing events in mammalian cells, right? Yeah, and yeah, because of usually because of single point mutations either in the pre-mRNA or mutations in the various factors and SNRP particles that are involved in the process. I mean, there are all sorts of reasons. So is that true that in plants, you know, the high plants, they also have splicing oh, events? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Do they have less mistake or they're pretty much similar like in mammalian cells? On that, I don't know, but I would presume it would be similar because plant genes are, I think, about the same size. I know they tend to be more AT rich than uh, animal genes, but is there, where are our plant biologists? Okay, but they certainly have introns, they certainly have huge introns, they certainly have alternative splicing. They have all the same things that mammalian cells do, yeah. I was thinking because plants have less chances of getting cancers and other disease, right? So well, maybe they maybe the mutations manifest themselves in different ways. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. So that that's really quite a fascinating story about the anti -ol uh, oligotherapy. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I wonder how the specificity of the treatment. Yeah, so the ones that are used are on the order of 20 nucleotides long. So that's you know pretty much in the range where given the sequence, you would predict that there would only be, on the basis of probability, one site in the human genome. And of course, that's something you have to worry about in these treatments. Are there other interactions that you don't know about that are going to cause deleterious long-term effects? Mm -hmm. And that's why I mentioned that at least over a you know, three-year period that this has been going on, it seems to have been much more positive than any negative effects that have been reported. Right. So you can't yeah. make these things too long. They get much more specific if you make them longer, but then they also have um, secondary target sites that could cause all sorts of other problems that you're not aware of. So in that therapy, the patient has to take? Uh, they get injections about every four months or five months into the spinal cord. So it goes directly to the tissue that is most affected. Now, you know, since all cells splice, nobody knows why it is that these particular cells are the ones that show the pathology of this particular disease, but that's true of many diseases, there are many ribosomopathies that affect ribosomes that then manifest themselves in very specific ways, and a lot of other things that's just something we don't understand yet. I have a rather naive question that I'm afraid to admit that I don't know the answer to, but what's the fate of the introns once they're spread out? Oh, so they get degraded. But what mechanism? So, Oh, there are all sorts of nucleases that are involved. So they're unprotected. You know, messenger RNA has a cap at the five prime end and a poly A tail at the three prime end. Uh, but if you are chopped out intron, you don't have either of those protective uh, structures. So nucleases start chewing in at the ends. I mean, a lot of these nucleases are known, but there are multiple ones of them that are involved in, in all these degradation processes. Second question that I have is, uh, there are other genes that are, when they're mutated, they're, they're associated with lupus? 
that they don't have any, at first approximation, don't have anything really to do with splicing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like TNF1, for example? Yeah. Do you, do you know? Yeah, no, so I mean, lupus doesn't, doesn't really have to do with splicing. It's that the targets of the autoantibodies that are made by lupus patients happen to be among them, in addition to DNA and ribosomes and RNA, um, very prominently these, these prominent nuclear bodies. Uh, but why that is, I don't know. Because lupus itself doesn't, doesn't directly have anything to do with splicing that I know of. Good, good question, I'm not naive. Other reflections? So is there, what's next? Is there more refreshments? Is that what's going on? So, Yes. Here. yes, please. So a virus I study in the lab has uh, an intron. So why would a virus need an intron? It's very short, less than yeah. one. Basically. Yeah, well, I, I don't know the why to any of these things. I just know that they do. Um, so if the host genome has introns, why shouldn't the virus have introns? I don't know why. I really don't know why we have introns. I mean, you can make all sorts of evolutionary arguments and then you can shuffle around exons and stuff like that more easily. And that sort of makes sense to me, but, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really sort of grab you as this is the reason why we have introns. Now, maybe alternative splicing, which means that, you know, any one gene could possibly give rise to two, three, five, ten different proteins that have slightly different functions. If that's controlled, that could be beneficial another way of multiplying the size of your genome. But, I don't know. Does anybody want to give a stab, an answer to that? Maybe a non-coding RNA molecules. Ah, maybe non-coding RNA molecules, that too, yes. There are a lot of mysterious things in biology that remain to be solved, so there are lots and lots of problems for all those of you out there who are interested in making discoveries and solving problems. Carly's going to rescue me. <laughs> All right, so uh, I think we'll call it a night here. There are lots more cookies in the back, so take one with you. Um, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Seitz, for the wonderful talk. <laughs>